All right, guys. Hello and welcome back. You guys ready? I assume you are. You're watching this video, right? <laughs> okay, let's get started. But before we do, you guys know me by now. You know that that is my website, joeyjohnsondo.com. And you know you can go there and donate your $3, right? If these videos have been a blessing to you or have helped you out significantly or even insignificantly, feel free to go there and donate your $3 or more. By all means, please do. Uh, the website, uh, excuse me, I have website there. I don't know why I wrote that. I meant email. Email is right there on the screen. Feel free to give me any feedback that you have. Let's talk about gram negative cocci and pleomorphic today, okay? Shall we? Let's begin. Okay, so when we talk about diplococci, we think about two circles, right? Two circles, those look like oxygens, looks like the diatomic molecule oxygen, O2, right? Well, guess what? All of the diplococci are going to be oxidase positive, as you can see right here. All of the gram-negative diplococci will be oxidase positive. So that's just a helpful way to remember that. So what you're going to do is you're going to test out the sugar. Now, Neisseria is nice, right? It's Neisseria, so I like sugar. It's sweet, right? Mm, gonorrhea, not so much, but hey, you get the point. So going through this, we're going to say that gram-negative diplococci, give it some sugar, give it some glucose, okay? That's going to knock out your morexella. And then you're going to come down here, and the G for glucose, you know that gonorrhea is definitely eating that stuff up, but both of them are actually going to grow on glucose. But then when you get maltose, then that is going to be even more selective than for the meningitis with the M. So once again, give glucose, that's going to uh, ferment your two gonorrheas, uh, excuse me, your two Neisserias, and then you give maltose, and then that's going to select out the meningitis, okay? And that's how you're going to separate those two. Now, over here for the Morixella, basically, if it's a gram-negative diplococci and it does not grow on the, on the glucose, then you know it's Morixella. It's Morixella cateriasis, typically. And so I think of boss cat. Okay, you're going to inhale this, and it can cause your bronchopneumonia. Not only does it cause bronchopneumonia, excuse my writing, of course, you also have otitis media, and you're going to have sinusitis. And if you guys remember... From the first uh, lecture that this is the number three cause for both of those okay and so that's pretty much all you have to know about morexella so now moving over here to the gonorrhea now gonorrhea it once it gets systemic it can actually cause septic arthritis and it is an std that usually uh, happens along with chlamydia so if someone gets diagnosed with chlamydia definitely go ahead and pre-treat or look for gonorrhea uh, depending on the school of thought there and um, something else too is uh, it can cause the anal rectal gonorrhea with purulence that that's pretty much what it's known for but it can cause conjunctivitis and blindness in neonates so if a neonate is born they have eye issues if they have like a trachoma then you're thinking chlamydia but if they uh, have blindness issues then you want to start thinking like gonorrhea as well and we'll get into some of that once we get on further down into the lecture series but gonorrhea can also cause pharyngitis as i've talked about before and the urethritis urethritis excuse me and cervicitis and like i said the the drug of choice here is going to be your ceph triaxon okay throw the ax at it try to ax that stuff out now let's get over here to Neisseria meningitidis. People with a C5 through C9 complement deficiency are going to be at very high risk for a systemic Neisseria meningitidis. Also, uh, if somebody has this, then you're going to give rifampin as prophylaxis. You'll notice, you'll start to notice later on that rifampin is uh, used for prophylaxis a lot of times. And uh, Neisseria meningitidis can cause pneumonia, obviously meningitis. And something else is the Friedrichs Waterhouse Friedrichs Friedrichs and Waterhouse syndrome. Excuse me, that's going to be apparent by high fever, petechiae, shock. You're going to get adrenal hemorrhaging. Okay, and so you can just think of your two kidneys like this, right? And then you can go ahead and place two M's on there for meningitis, and it causes bleeding bilaterally. That's a big thing bilaterally. So that's your Friedrichs and Waterhouse syndrome right there. You could take care of Neisseria meningitis by just giving a little pin G. And Neisseria meningitis, something about it I do want to highlight is it's part of your shin mnemonic. So shin are going to be your IgA protease bacteria. And if you remember, then your IgA, you got the heavy chains, okay? This, it's a dimer, the salivary IgA is at least. It's a dimer there. The IgA protease is going to come right there, just kind of bust that up right there. And so it's going to render it 
where it doesn't really work, okay? It just splits it up, and so now it's just a mess, and so that's what IgA protease does. The ones who are at risk for that are people who are asplenics. Now, of course, if somebody has Epstein-Barr virus, you know, you're worried about mono, and one of the things you tell them is, hey, don't go play any contact sports because your spleen might burst, right? And so if people have uh, asplenia, then you're going to have to protect against those. Now, what are those? That's going to be your strep pneumo, your homophilus influenza, and your Neisseria meningitidis. Those are your three that are in that shin mnemonic. So now, gram-negative cocobacilli and pleomorphic. Let's get to those, okay? Now, the way you'll remember this is Bart's Garden, border France. There's the border right there. And then also remember, I like having Pastor Bruce. I told you Pastor Bruce would come back, right? So Bart's Garden borders France. There's the border. And I like having Pastor Bruce. I is for ignore. Bartonella, that is known as cat scratch fever. It's going to be a very localized purulence and lymphadenitis. That's why I have a little green nodule there. Very localized, okay? And you're going to find that through a silver stain. Another way you can get it, I doubt you'll probably see it this way, but it can be from a sandfly bite if you're in Andes Mountain. Okay, so now let's go over here to Gardnerella. Gardnerella is going to have a gray discharge, as I've talked about before. It's going to have a very fishy odor for that. You're going to test it by the whiff test. Please hold your comments. And you're going to test it with KOH for that. And KOH is, of course, potassium hydroxide. The pH is typically for this going to be greater than 4.5, as it is for most things that are going to grow pathogenically down the uh, vagina besides candidiasis, okay? You're going to have a much higher pH than normal. And you're going to give Metro here because, like I said before, Metro will take care of downtown. Clinda stays up, keeps it PG, right? And a big clue here that you're going to see are clue sales. So these are the things you're going to look for for Gardnerella. Fishy smell, whiff test, pH greater than 4.5. Uh, Metro is your drug of choice, and clue sales. So let's move on now to Bordetella pertussis, okay? Whooping cough. Now for Bordetella pertussis, you're going to have copious amounts of uh, productive cough there, all right? So and if you remember, Bordetella pertussis is going to work by inhibiting the GI subunit, thereby indirectly upgrading the CAMP. You're going to get it through inhalation, all right? It's typically seen in kids that are less than 15 years old. As I've said, copious amounts of sputum, a paroxysmal cough that just grips you and kind of has an inspired whoop about it. And you're going to test for it with the Reagan Low charcoal or with the Bordak and Gal medium. I went over that at the first lecture. And that's pretty much the big stuff about whooping cough. Let's go to Francis Ella Tularemia. If you remember me telling you streptomycin is going to be really good to take care of tularemia as well as tuberculosis. Francisella tularemia, you used to always see it coming from rabbits, people who were hunters and skinners, okay? But something else that you can get from Francisella tularemia, you can get Francisella tularemia from, is from deer flies. All right. You can also possibly get it from uh, a tick bite. But what you're going to see with that is you have your skin, and then you're going to have a heat up ulceroglandular lesion there on your skin. And you have very localized swelling and very localized pain. And you're also going to have painful lymph nodes that come out of this, okay? And if you inhale it, it could cause atypical pneumonia. Let's go on over to Legionella now. This is a big one. All right, so for Legionella, it's almost like where to begin on this one. So you're going to test for it with charcoal yeast or silver stain. Obviously, it's one of your cysteines. When I talked about uh, Pastor Bruce casting a legion out of uh, Francis in the Sistine Chapel, um, it has very high fevers, nausea and vomiting. It's more common in the elderly, and you're going to get it with standing water. So if you see something in the vignette about someone's in a hot tub, they work with air conditioners, they're around air conditioners, very closed-in spaces, or even the sprinkler system at the grocery stores is starting to come up a lot now. So say you have an elderly couple that buys fresh fruits and veggies from the sprinkler, you know, up under the sprinkler system there at the grocery store, you want to think Legionella. There are a couple of very highlighted points I want to point out, though, about Legionella that you should look for and be aware of. Number one is it can cause either pneumonia-like symptoms or it can cause flu-like symptoms. If it causes pneumonia-like symptoms, then that is going to be Legionnaire's disease. If it's causing flu-like symptoms, then you're talking Pontiac fever then. 
Now, big things about Legionella, definitely be aware of, okay, is hyponatremia. Burn these into your brain, okay? Hyponatremia, very high fever, hepatic dysfunction, hematuria, and diarrhea, okay? If you see these things, you're really wanting to start thinking Legionella, okay? I'm not saying they're pathognomonic for it, but definitely if someone has diarrhea, if they have hepatic dysfunction, hematuria, uh, high fever, hyponatremia, and also if you're seeing like some kind of flu-like or pneumonia-like symptoms, um, the the coughs may be non-productive, but they could have blood streaks in them as well, so it varies on that. But definitely start thinking Legionella with all that. And something else I've been seeing pop up a lot is the urine antigen test. Okay, you can use the urine antigen test for some things. For instance, cyclomegalovirus, CMV, it will have the owl's eyes appearance under that. But uh, definitely for Legionella, I've been seeing it pop up about the urine antigen test. All right, so I think that's about all I want to go over on that. It can cause uh, community-acquired pneumonia um, is how you would kind of categorize that. So let's go on now to the homophilus influenza. So for that, uh, homophilus influenza, there are three different things we can talk about. One is the Egyptius. Excuse me, my phone is ringing. There we go. All right, now for that one, mainly you're going to think conjunctivitis in kids. And Brazilian kids may have fatal septic shock with it. All right, and so then we're also going to talk about this one, which is Ducrine. The main thing about it is you get a you get a canker that is painless with syphilis, but with Ducrine, Haemophilus Ducrine, then you get a canker that is painful. It's a cankeroid actually, and um, so if you have a painful lesion on your genitalia, then they can Ducrine because you do cry with Ducrine. And if you have a painless lesion, then think syphilis. All right, so homophilus influenza B. Um, well, like I talked about in the first lecture series on chocolate auger, when these are growing, homophilus ducari will grow with heme factor X, but not with 5. Now, when we talk about homophilus influenza B, it's going to grow with factor X and factor 5. So that's how you'll differentiate between those two. This one right here can cause meningitis. And if you remember uh, with otitis media, when we were talking about our most commons, as well as our sinusitis, okay, this is going to be the second most common cause of otitis media and of sinusitis, okay. Um, let's see, it can cause pneumonia, and uh, epiglottitis is a big one with this. If you see epiglottitis, definitely go for this one. This is your one that you're definitely going for with epiglottitis. Pasturella, you're going to think cat or dog bite. Sometimes they'll have a musty odor associated with it. You can get pen G for it. And they'll have buttery colonies on a blood auger. Okay? And the big things that it can cause here for Pasturella, it is oxidase and catalase uh, positive also. I've come across that before. But the big things is osteomyelitis, bacteremia, cellulitis, lymphadenitis. So what I would say out of those is if you think Pasturella, Think about, uh, I've heard someone say cats drinking pasteurized milk, but just know that cat or dog bite, musty odor, buttery colonies on a blood auger, and osteomyelitis or cellulitis. Now, brucella, that is actually going to be pathognomonic with an undulating fever, pretty much. So if you see an undulating fever, which is kind of going up and down, up and down fever, okay, you're thinking brucella. It's going to be one of your intracellulars, facultatively, like francisella. All right, and it comes from ingesting unpasteurized dairy products like milk or goat cheese or also contact with infected animals. And so that is brucella, and that will complete our gram-negative rods as well as our gram-negative, uh, I mean, excuse me, our gram-negative cocci, I apologize, plus our gram-negative pleomorphics. And finally, above all, $3. If you have not donated, by all means, feel free to go to my website and donate $3. I appreciate it. Talk to you guys next time.